All right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody, uh, no matter where you're at on this planet. Uh, this wonderful Wednesday here in September. Uh, fall is dawning here in New York City, where I'm at. Um, but just wanted to welcome everybody to the webinar today. Uh, and thank you for taking time out of your day to, to join us. Uh, I hope I have, and I think I have, a whole lot of database enthusiasts on the call today. Um, today is a special topic and one that I love uh, to present. And, and I love going through this material. It just reminds me every time I go through this material how special uh, what I feel, you know, what we built here at Cockroach is. Um, you know, if we look at the future of the database and everything, I think it's just a, it's some amazing technology. And I love exposing it and getting it out there uh, for everybody to see. Um, you know, our, our, our code is, is open source. Uh, you know, what I'm going to present today is, uh, you know, some, some slides uh, and, and to a description of, of how we do things. Um, which I hope opens up the eyes of people to a not just um, you know the the power of a distributed database and, and what goes into actually doing something like this, but I think also you know using some of the concepts and tools that we use uh, within within our approach to building distributed systems in the way that you think about distributed systems and as you break down you know applications and and you start deploying things in in a distributed manner what does that actually mean uh, what are the things you have to look out for so. I hope that that everybody gets value out of this today. Um, my name is Jim Walker. I am a VP of product marketing here at Cockroach Labs. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a very happy employee of, of what I think is, a, is an interesting company and some amazing technology. And, and what I'm presenting today, again, is the work of a whole lot of people over years and years. Uh, none of this can be done alone. So I thank everybody, uh, A, and the company for building it, but B, for helping me build together this, uh, this presentation. We often get asked to introduce at the very beginning, you know, what level of expertise this webinar will be, beginner, advanced, or I mean, this is definitely an intermediate. I'm not going to be in code. I'm not going to be uh, any CLI here. It's just straight, it's based straight up slides, but it is an in-depth look at kind of uh, under the covers what we've done to actually build a distributed SQL database. So I hope that's valuable to you. There's a couple people on the phone today with me um, that are that are monitoring things. So typically, I'm monitoring chat and trying to inter interact with uh, with the audience. But uh, I think several members of our team are in the public chat. Uh, so please do ask questions there. Um, you know, we we love the banter. We love the questions. We hope that there's a lot of questions in this particular topic because there's a lot to go through. Uh, and then my friend Chris is on uh, with me, so he'll be helping to monitor the QA panel as well. So if you prefer to do things in QA. Uh, it's more private, I guess. Uh, please do that. But but engagement and everything is 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 huge for us, uh, and I think uh, valuable to everybody. So I'll try to monitor some things and, and throw in some some explanations along the way um, from from what I see in the chat and the QA. It's kind of difficult. Got a lot of material, and I want to get to it. So uh, so again, thank you everybody for joining us. So let's just start here. And and why do we need another database? Relational databases have been around since the 70s. They're fantastic. That's what I learned back when I was in, you know, undergrad. Uh, you know, SQL is kind of lingua franca of data. Um, you know, building applications on, you know, something standard and, and, and real that actually handles transactions is great. You know, about 10, 12, 15 years ago, you know, the world needed scale. Uh, you know, the internet had changed everything uh, and just global distribution became extremely important. So, you know, a group of companies emerged that basically took the rails off of our relational paradigms and said, you know, what can we do to basically, uh, you know, eliminate uh, th those, 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 those requirements so that we can actually can get fast reads. You know, we can get rights in all over the planet, but maybe they're not as, as guaranteed or as consistent as, as, you know, we have in some of the relational stores. And so, you know, the emergence of NoSQL databases uh, has been phenomenal for us. I joke with people, I, I, I typically will say, man, this pandemic sure would be horrible if we didn't have Cassandra, because I got to tell you, Cassandra has driven a whole lot of fun for us uh, over the past couple months as, as we kind of uh, have been in quarantine and dealing with you know streaming and everything else and, and these tools are incredibly powerful however what's happened over the past couple of years especially with this transition to the cloud as people are moving relational workloads into the cloud the, these no sql databases can't handle the transactions or basically the global latencies that that many of our applications demand for for transactions right and so you know for us it's you know how do, how do we re-architect how do we dream from from the ground up a new database um, something that can scale, something that is resilient, something that can actually provide low latency access to data and rights across the entire planet. And there's an emergence of a group of databases, or several of us, I think some of you are on the call, um, 
that, that are doing something that's, that's very different. Um, and it is distributed SQL. This isn't taking legacy database and, you know, modifying it and augmenting it with a different storage layer or something like that. No, this is truly building from the ground up um, from, from where we hit disk all the way up to the interface, the user um, to be truly a distributed system. So um, CockroachDB was, is spawn of Google Cloud Spanner, which is a wonderful database um, that, that's offered from Google. Um, also distributed SQL. Uh, you know, they, they launched a, they, they published a white paper. Uh, you know, we, we, we follow a lot of the, the same context in there, as concepts in there, but have advanced it um, fairly uh, extensively um, over the course of the past five years. And that's what I want to talk about. And so distributed SQL, if I think about it, number one, it has to implement SQL because that's what databases are. Uh, you know, I think transactions in that sort of world, I don't think SQL goes away. I think some people believe that it might, but I, I think it's the, that that's with us and it's going to be with us for the foreseeable future. It needs to ease scale. It needs to be always on a resilient. Um, we need to guarantee transactions. So if we're going to be a system of record and global scale, you have to guarantee transactions. Uh, we implement serializable isolation. I'll show you a little bit of how we do that. And then tying data to the location is something that I think every person should uh, be concerned about with distributed SQL because as you have distributed systems, uh, and as you start to deal with these sort of things, um, latency becomes a really big issue and a really, really big problem. And the only way to actually deal with latency, well, is to be able to have data follow the user or be close to a transaction, if you will. You know, there's some other things that are really nice about tying data location, compliance, uh, you know, allowing data to be, you know, all German data lives in German on German servers, that sort of, let's let the database deal with that. Um, you know, we implemented a feature called geo-partitioning so that we can actually, uh, you know, tie data to location. So you know, we can optimize at the table level uh, how quickly you can access data so or, or how you fail things right how, what, what's your survival mechanism uh, that, that you implement in the database itself but I feel that you know these are the five requirements for something to be truly distributed system distributed SQL a lot of this is just distributed systems basic stuff right design atomic unit I can scale it's disposable it's designed for resilience a lot of stuff that we think about in the kubernetes world and the way we the way we define new systems so um, our vision is to be a global database. Uh, this is, you know, have a have a relational database that's available, always on, and available to everybody. So we are we are are, are building to that. Uh, how do we actually deploy something as a service for everybody on the single on the, on the on the planet? That is, you know, you no longer have to worry about nodes and resilience and all these different things. That's where we're skating to. Let me just show you kind of where we're at, though. We've been building for about five and a half years. We have built a database. Databases are not simple. Uh, if you're familiar with Michael Stonebreaker, he'll say, I think databases take seven to nine years to be fully mature. Well, we're doing a database and we're doing a distributed system. There's lots of nuance there. We'll show you a little bit of that. We have built out all the hardcore, you know, enterprise capabilities around security, backup, restore, the stuff, the, man the management, the monitoring, the UI, all that stuff has to be there for somebody to adopt a database in production. And then we've deployed this as a service, which is a wholly other function actually as a, as a company. Lots of people using us, uh, people using us as a general purpose database. Uh, we are perfectly good at that. Uh, and, and a replacement to maybe an open source database, you just want to run us as a service, you know, try out Cockroach Cloud. Uh, a lot of people using us as a system of record, say for financial data or, you know, Kindred Group using us for online betting. Um, but we actually can do some things that, that push us into the translitical database and doing some basic kind of, you know, analytics within the database as well. But, you know, we're proud of our customers. Not really a, 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 this is, today is all about, let's get into the architecture. I am at 12 minutes past, so I want to actually get into it, right? Um, but this actually sets us up. Um, you know, this is unique. This is a distributed architecture. Um, simply spin a node up of Cockroach database, point it at a cluster, and it participates in that cluster. The, class, the cluster itself gossips and and, and interacts with every with all the other nodes to actually understand where data should live within that within that with that group of clusters, right? Um, it's going to coordinate uh, and gain consensus for all queries and transactions. Um, it's going to repair and rebalance. There's no more manual sharding. Spin up a node, point at the cluster. Data is balanced out based on what you want to actually do with that data, and I'll get into that. And then also being able to attach data to a location is a key thing. All of this is done basically with a simple composable unit of a cockroach DB instance. It's actually pretty important to understand because we don't have, you know, different types of nodes. We have just one node and it's one composable unit. 
it, it, it's the single atomic unit and every node in a cockroach database is a single consistent gateway to the entirety of the database. So I could have a database that has clusters and nodes all over the world. It looks like one logical database to the application that is accessing it in whichever region it is accessing to every node can have access to the entirety of the database, which is actually a really, really important point. So, so how do we do this? Um, Ultimately, we are exposed as a relational database. This is transactional relational SQL that you would expect in Postgres. We are wire compatible with Postgres, um, which means we speak the API. Um, we do a lot of the things in the SQL syntax, which are similar. We don't do some things. Um, and that's all due to basically the way that we implement uh, the database itself and the distributed nature of what we're doing. But we are wire compatible. So just as you would use something like Postgres, you can actually implement CockroachDB as well. Um, but we're gonna go through a couple of different things here. At the, at the core, at the base of what we're doing, ultimately in any database, there's storage, there's execution, and then there's a language or an API in which you access that database. Um, at the storage layer, we are implemented as a KV store. And we, we actually convert KV to relational within the database itself. Every table within CockroachDB is stored as this monolithic logical key space. Um, we basically take every row and we determine a key for each row, and then we basically alphabetize it. We put it in order, um, lexicographically by that key. Now, it allows us to do some really cool things, but the old way of doing things, well, if I wanted to write to an inventory table, I would just keep appending records, and then I have an index, which is my key, and basically I can sort that by whatever I want to do. Here it's by, by name. Um, and I can access that data. And basically it's this index that's pointing at, you know, the various different entries. This is a series of pointers going to all these different things, right? Well, that is, uh, that's good. And that, that's worked in the old relational way, but how do we actually use that to be distributed? There's no order, right? And, and I'll show you how we actually use order to understand we use Raft actually as a distributed consensus protocol to control all this. So what we're doing is we're actually converting um, this SQL at the top level to a KV store. Now, we get a lot of the powerful nature of a KV database um, and we can expose that. So we can do things like scans. We can delete on a key very quickly, right? We can get and put, right? And so it allows us to do some really, really interesting, very, very, very efficiently. Now, when I store data into a cockroach table, um, in a cockroach database table, this is the dogs table. Um, the key here is just the name of a dog. These are all the office dogs that we have. Mine is in the middle, they're muddy. Um, but what we're doing is we're taking each um, key value pair and we're storing it as a key and a value. Um, the key being something that we I wanna sort things on and then the value being each of the columns that we wanna store for that particular key. Let me show you how that works. Actually, it's, it's pretty, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. You know, in a, in, a, in a traditional database, when we wanna create a table, we just say, okay, great table, ID, name, weight, right? Our table entries might look like this, an ID, you know, some random arbitrary number, unique ID, whatever you want, right? Um, and that's what a table will look like. That's the dog's table uh, in, our, in our traditional way. And that's really what we expose at the top level of, of our, you know, when, when people are interacting with, with Cockroach. Now, underneath the covers, the way that we store this stuff is very different. We will basically take each of the rows, here, here's the same table, and we're gonna break it down into entries, right? And so we're gonna use the key, right? So dog slash 34, and then basically we're gonna say, okay, the column name, name, okay, great. The value is Carl, column name, wait, okay. They, and so what we're doing is we're basically storing all of this data in order. So now when we put data, right, we wanna actually go put a new record in here. We're gonna know by the unique ID, okay, the dog table and say the unique ID is eight C, great. I'm gonna put it right here, right? Right in the middle here. Now this gives us some really powerful benefits in the way that we actually shard the data automatically inside Cockroach database. Now, ultimately at the very, very base layer though, we are a KV store. Now choosing the primary key in a Cockroach implementation is, is absolutely paramount. It's super, super huge. And when you choose that key, sometimes you wanna actually maybe partition data by location. Um, we're going to actually embed, say, a country code within that key itself. And because everything is, is, is ordered, well, now I can say like, hey, look at all the records that were Germany because they were in that key. They were sorted and they were at the very top, right? And I can actually take those ranges, shards, if you will, and I can put those only on German servers. And so that is the trick to actually how we have implemented geopartition is at the very, very lowest layer, 
of the storage layer of Cockroach Database, right? And so I want to show you a little bit about that, but it actually does a lot of different things, right? There's huge, huge efficiencies here we get uh, because we're sorting, we can ensure it against null values. Uh, and this also allows us to do a fairly uh, acceptable Uh oh, I'm sorry, y'all. My my router. I don't. I gotta get a new one. I think I dropped for about two seconds there. Nothing too hugely important. We're back on the key space. Sorry about that, y'all. Um, and and if I think you know Chris and some of the team are in chat and QA, um, I'm happy to see the chat has lit up. Uh, y'all, please do ask questions there. I'm going through this fairly quickly, but like I said, there's a team of us on the on the call today that are happy to answer questions in the chat. Um, I'm going through it because I think, you know, you'll get the recording. You can actually, you could fast forward through this like 10 seconds I just wasted. So back to this monolithic key space, right? Each table is now sorted by alphabetically, if you want to hear, but but just think of that as that key, like this, this uh, you know, a, a couple of different values, the table, the primary key, and maybe there's something else that we put in this. We can also do secondary indexes on this and everything else. So I'm not going to get into that today, but this is the core basics of, of Cockroach Database. Now, what we can do what we do is we actually take this key space and we divide it into these 64 megabit ranges. Actually, I think we're playing around with larger ranges, but this was the size that we determined would be the most efficient to move around very easily within a cluster um, without actually you know, causing too many issues or latencies as we kind of move things around. Because ultimately this is what we refer to or what typically people think of as shards. And we're automating um, these shards as well, right? Let me just go through an example, right? These things are, are really small. Um, but actually, in order to find these things, we actually index, uh, we create an index structure. It's very much like a B tree, so it's very easy to find these things. I mean, undergrad computer science, you understand a B tree, so pretty simple and straightforward, but it's a key piece of what we're doing here. We can do some, some nice little efficient range scans. Like, I don't need to go to every node. You could imagine this, this range, the second range, and the third range are all, uh, you know, living on different nodes within the cluster. Well, if I wanted to do a range scan, right, I would have to go to every single node in the database. That's not very efficient. Um, we can actually do it just across these small ranges, right? Because everything is, is lexicographically ordered, we can actually do some very, very efficient range scans um, within CockroachDB. Okay, so when I update a record, say I want to insert a new record into the dogs table, I want to insert Sonny, my friend Jeremy's dog. Um, okay, so I go and it says, okay, that's in the third range. I'm going to go ask that range, the RAP leader of that range, and I'll come back to RAP. Hey, do you got space? Yes, great. Insert this record. Great. Inserted it. Works. Bob, your uncle, let's move on, right? Now I want to insert the next record, Rudy, right? And now there is no space in that range. What's happening under the covers is Cockroach understands that I've gone beyond the 64 megabit size, right? The, the size of this particular range. And it's going to split that range and insert the record. Now we aren't doing this in real time because we actually, you know, we'll actually go a little bit over the, the size of the range, what it needs to be, because I don't want to hold up a transaction. I want that to be done efficiently, right? Um, but we're doing the background. We'll actually clean these things up. But what we've done right now, we just automated the entire sharding process. So as records are getting created, I've just sharded, I created a whole new shard of data. Now, I, I, I've sharded a database before, this is not a fun thing to do, right? And so we're basically just taking care of this. We automating this splitting of ranges. We can actually compact them as well over time as well um, as, data, as data compacts as well, but this is the insert, right? Okay, so I talked a little bit about this concept of raft at the, in, the, in the middle of that. And I, I hope everybody's getting their questions, Ashton. I, I, Chris, you're on it. So. Um, please do again ask questions in the in the chat. It's really really helpful. So there's a lot going on. So it's hard for me to actually uh, look and actually I, I capture it all. So um, raft is something that if you are new to distributed systems, I would go look up raft and check out some of the explanations of raft. I'm going to give you some small explanation of it in terms of how it applies to what we're thinking in Cockroach database. Now there's another uh, distributed consensus protocol you hear of Paxos. Um, we chose Raft. In fact, uh, you know, our implementation is actually using up, upstream etcd Raft, actually. Um, you know, we're, we're finding things and committing them upstream and etcd. etcd does use Raft as well. Um, and it is a distributed consensus protocol. It allows us to create these kind of atomic rights across a set of data, right? So um, what we're doing is when we write data to Cockroach database, we're writing it in triplicate. Remember I said each of these ranges, 
Well, in this picture, you can imagine this was that blue range. I forget which I forget which dogs were in this blue range, but I guess it was Lula, Lady, Muddy, and Petey. Muddy's in the Muddy's in the blue range. That's good, right? And so what I have is I have three replicas, and I'm writing them to different nodes. Now, those those three replicas they comprise a raft group, right? And then there's a in, in the in the in the raft documentation you'll hear of a raft leader. Um, there's there's and there's a they actually so somebody just pointed out that there's a the university cockroach university goes through a great explanation of this. Will and team does an amazing job uh, describing this, so that's a really good place to learn too. We have a raft we have a leaseholder which is basically the raft leader in the in that documentation. That's really where all transactions are going to be. Um, um, executed for that particular raft group, right? It coordinates all the rights, right? It is the authoritative up-to-date understanding of, of where that kind of raft group needs to be. Now, when we write to Cockroach um, and we write to a raft group, well, we need quorum rights. We need two of three of the nodes to actually come back, and that's when we can actually commit a transaction. I'll go through how that works a little bit, a little bit, a little bit later. Um, so I kind of went through this. Uh, it's, you know, each, each range is a wrap group. Uh, we're defaulting to three. And in any cluster, imagine this. I just showed you, what, 12 records in a table, and I had, you know, three ranges. Um, there's going to be tens or hundreds of thousands of ranges um, within a cluster. And all this coordination is going on in the background uh, behind what looks like a very simple SQL database. Um, Raft is very chatty. Uh, there's heartbeats going on, lots of stuff. So you, you can get in. I don't want to get too deep into that. So, all right. So, um, how do we actually place these replicas, right? So, it's distributed consensus protocol. Uh, we're actually using Raft to actually control all of this. Um, so, we can actually do a couple different things. We can actually control uh, when and where data gets uh, written to a cluster uh, based on certain things. This is how we do scale, this is how we do resilience. Um, this is how we do geo replication why not tim thank you for joining me as well An another one of our our great uh solution engineers is on the phone to help answer questions as well so even more firepower for all your questions you always are asking so i think the easiest way to think about the way that get data gets written into a cockroach cluster you could imagine here we have a four node cluster each one of these uh green cylinders being an instance of, of cockroach db you know spun it up it's, it's running somewhere. Um, and so this all works like a cluster. So that light green basically is, is an instance of Cockroach database. Now these things could be living in a single region. They could be in multiple different regions and multiple different availability zones, lots of different things because ultimately you're gonna wanna place data into the cluster based on what you wanna survive, right? I always think about Cockroach database and, and you know, typically when we implemented a database in the past, you, know, you think about the logical model you know, what the table's got to look like, what referential integrity is going to look like, you know, the, the DML, right, and, and the DDL, what's going on in this, in this database, you know, there's, there's another layer that you need to think about when you're implementing um, Cockroach database, and that's really resilience and latency, how fast I want data accessible to users and what I want to survive. Typically, we start with what you want to survive, and that's typically the kind of the first vector in which people think, because we want to survive a disk failure, a machine failure, a rack, a data center, or a region, we can configure at the table level how we're gonna actually survive these sort of failures. So I can actually survive uh, an entire region failing, right? Because I just place replicas in the right places, right? I can actually, at the table level, at the actually at the row level, if I wanna survive a failure, I want one copy in US East, one copy in US West, and say one over in Europe somewhere so that if you know the West Coast falls off the off the end of the ocean, I still have two copies of that data. Cockroach is smart enough to actually understand that and you still can do quorum rights, right? Now there's a lot more that goes into that. And there's a lot of great conversations we have with our customers um, that, that, will, that we can help you through this whole process of what you want to survive. In this case, we're just doing a diversity. Um, I'm just going to throw, we're going to, you know, we're going to balance out this load across all the different nodes. So the first range gets written across node one, node two, node four. Um, the second range, my favorite range, gets written across node one, node two, node three, and then the third range gets written across those. Now I can survive the loss of one of these nodes, and we'll show you that. We can also do some things. Um, sometimes you have a hot range. Um, you know, there's a record that everybody loves. In this case, it's muddy, of course, it's my dog. Um, everybody wants to access that record or write to that record, whatever it is. Um, and so sometimes you have a hot range, and we're actually using data within the cluster itself to optimize this. So 
we can actually segment off a particular range to a particular node based on load as well. So we can optimize from a utilization point of view, right? Um, you know, uh, it's some pretty advanced stuff underneath the covers going on to actually do that. But again, we can still survive. We can also use this, this replica placement to understand where data gets placed um, within a cluster as well. Remember, I was talking about the key. And so if we added, you know, the, say the, 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 the index was name, but we added EU to that, we appended EU to name, right? And that's basically the location of, of that data, EU, US East and US West. Oh, I, my colors are wrong. These, this, this US West should be red and the European one should be this orange or yellow or whatever. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, but, but we can actually now understand by the primary key because this is all now sorted, right? This is a sorted order. This is just one table, it's all sorted. That range, I am guaranteed that all the records in that range are gonna be the, the EU records. Now I can place those because each node within Cockroach has a name to it. And it's like, okay, great. Only nodes that are named EU can accept these nodes. This is how we can do both placement for latency, right? Because I want data to be close to these users, right? All of those dogs are in Europe, say, whatever. Um, or we can use this for this, this compliance thing, this jurisdictional control of data. I want all German records to live in Germany, right? And so lots of interesting things we can do with that. And, and a really, really powerful feature, feature of Cockroach. Now, not only can we do this uh, when you define the table, we can actually do this in production. We do online schema changes. So uh, you can change a schema, not just the columns that comprise the table, but we can do online schema changes for a primary key as well. In this case, our primary key is, is location appended with the name. Now, what if I changed, you know, the, 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 yeah, I can you run an alter table basically, and it's just telling me that all records that are uh, US East, uh, say I, I lost a region, I want it all to go to one set of nodes. Without taking the database down, we can change that at the table level. And Cockroach is smart enough to actually just move all the data around to wherever these nodes are. Say I bring up a new region and I have, you know, Africa region and everything that was in the EU, say Sushi and Z are in the Africa region. I just basically do alter table and say I have some new nodes and I want to do that. I'll, I'll show you some of those commands. It's in the presentation a little bit later, but we can do an online schema change. Now I haven't had bung the database down. I didn't have to create new shards. I didn't have to do anything really. I basically did an alter table and the database took care of moving that data around. So it's, to me, pretty magical. Uh, and, and really tied to what we're doing at the storage layer uh, and, and from the KV all the way up. Now, recently over the past two weeks, uh, you may have seen, some of you may have seen, um, we actually, uh, we were using RocksDB at the storage layer to actually uh, do all this KV stuff. Um, we actually re-implemented that, actually it's a small enough level DB um, in something called Pebble. Now Pebble allows us to even have more granular control over how we can do this and improve performance at this layer as well. So it's given us a lot of control. If you're interested at this layer in any more depth and understanding how we actually implemented a KV store in Golang, um, I would check out that post. Um, it's, I think it's like the second or third last post on our, on, our, on our blog right now. So if you're watching this and it's six months from now, it's from middle of September. So there, I, I at least thought about that. So. Um, it's some really interesting things there too. And, and Peter Mattis, uh, our CTO, uh, has some, some really good, good, good material in there that talks to this. There's also another blog post that talks about how to choose a primary key in, in Cockroach database. Uh, we'll actually talk a lot about this. Another really, really great resource. Uh, and then I, I would be remiss if I think in every single webinar I've ever done, except for like the high level business ones, our docs are phenomenal. Everything I'm talking about today is in the architecture section of our docs. And, uh, you know, Jesse and team, kudos to you all because you guys, it's, it's some of the best docs I've ever seen in the business. So uh, please, all this stuff is, is documented there. Um, so let's talk about rebalancing, right? So uh, I, again, we can spin up a node anywhere and because it's an own atomic unit, it doesn't have to be a type of node, it's just cockroach. I pointed at a cluster and the cluster is smart enough, right? To actually understand, hey, I have new space so I want to actually rebalance data. So it's going to basically seek its level based on workload or what you want to survive, all the, the policy that we put in place to basically say, hey, great, I have a new node. Let's balance my data. I have just sharded the database. Um, and so there's no downtime in the middle of the night. There's no like manual understanding of what these records are and doing all these things. 
you know, I've heard of, you know, like, like I think Facebook Messenger ran on, I think, 100 or so shards. Somebody was telling me once, um, you know, just the management of that alone has got to be tremendous from a, from a people power and time point of view. Um, and so just taking all that right off the table is what we can do with basically that. Um, sometimes, and actually everything fails at some point in its life, right? So sometimes we have, uh, you know, a permanent failure if a, net, if a node goes down. Um, you know, Raft is going to realize that there's an under-replicated uh, replica step. Uh, there's under-replicated data because look, two of my replicas are gone. So I'm Raft. I want three. I'm going to maintain. There's three copies of my data. Wait a second. I only have two. What's going on? Freak out. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The database is actually understanding that and saying, great, I need to basically re-replicate that data. Now, we don't do that immediately. Um, you know, we'll do that after a timeout. I forget what it is. I don't know if Chris or whatever, if somebody wants to chat what that is. Um, I forget what the default is. I don't want to, wanna, you know, misstate it. Um, but sometimes, you know, nodes go down for a half a minute or a minute and they may come back. And so we can actually endure that uh, and we can have some sort of temporary failure, in which case, you know, oh gosh, you know, four transactions happen in that three seconds of that range. Well, it's just going to basically use the log, basically kind of, it's a little more complex than that, to basically keep that replica up to date because the raft leader in this case the blue one the raft leader knows what the replica set should look like and it says hey you're out of sync so you need to get an order and here's what you need to have right and so we actually deal with that um at the it was so it, within a temporary failure but in the case of a, of a hard failure the whole node goes out it's gone for five minutes the, again raft is smart enough to understand hey i have to recreate this this replica somewhere because i got i gotta have three right um, i can still do quorum right so i have two of three right all right, so uh, that's surviving. Okay, so now, uh, wow, man, I just flew right through this stuff, you guys. So, all right, we are at 35 minutes past. So I hope there's some really good questions there. Um, again, please do um, ask a bunch of stuff. I think the guys are answering stuff and answered. I see stuff disappearing. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Tim. Um, so let's talk a little bit about distributed transactions now. Um, and we're getting into a little bit more advanced. I, the the KV to, to SQL thing is, is really, really important. Now, you know, a transaction, um, you know, this, this, this concept of, of acid, you know, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability um, is still important today, uh, as, as, as it ever was. I mean, if there was ever a, a context that was, that was more important in the database world, this is it. You know, we spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, the A and the I, the atomicity of a transaction. So it, you know, um, coming together and actually, you know, inserting all and it's, you know, a transaction is a transaction. Um, a query is a query, I guess, in the transaction, uh, the execution schedule is, 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 is done in its entirety. Um, and then isolation is a big deal. We, you know, often talk about this in terms of, yeah, I think it's overloaded with the word consistency. Um, but in CockroachDB, we have optimized for two things. Um, at the isolation level, it's serializable isolation. So what we've done, and, and because we've tuned the database in this way, and because the engineers uh, here at Cockroach have done a phenomenal job thinking through what this means in a distributed database, right, with, with, with Quorum and MVCC and, and, and what we're doing with RAF, um, we have the gold level of, of isolation. So we are guaranteed consistent in transactions. We aren't going to allow for, you know, dirty reads or phantom reads, some of the issues you have with these casually consistent or eventually consistent databases. I think some of the NoSQL databases will allow for transactions, but they'll be eventually consistent, which just means they are not consistent. Like problems can happen. Um, there's a paper out there if you're interested. I believe it was a professor at Berkeley. Gosh, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm totally flaking right now. Um, but look it up. It's called Acid Rain, Acid Rain Database. It's a really interesting if you really want to geek out on some really interesting things of why it, it outlines how, how isolation levels can cause incredibly huge problems for databases. I'm an ex-developer. I know Tim and Chris are ex-developers. I think isolation levels is one of these things we just expect the database to deliver on. We don't think about resetting the isolation level. In fact, you know, when I got the cockroach, it was one of these things I like, oh, you have to set that, right? Like, so, you know, what, what can go wrong will, um, and there's bad people out there and they're gonna wanna see what they can do wrong. And so for us, you know, if we're gonna be a system of record, we've implemented serializable isolation in the database. We're, guarantee, we're guaranteeing transactions and eliminating uh, some of these data issues that you find in, in, in other database. Now, look, there's like Postgres, Oracle, SQL Server, like you, could implement, you, you can choose serializable isolation. 
Our choice was to do it in a distributed database, which is a wholly other level because the other side and the other kind of primitive in which we've, we've designed for is not just this consistency, but you know, our ultimate competition is the speed of light. Um, how do we do this at global scale? How does, a, how does a transaction happen in Sydney and New York at the same time on the same record? And we're gonna be guaranteed consistent across that, right? And so I'm gonna go through how transactions work in Cockroach and then a little bit about how we can actually attain some really advanced topics in terms of you know, how, how we can actually reduce latencies. Remember the, the, the partitioning of data, the geo-partitioning, placing data in the right location, a RAF group living in a uh, region, you're gonna have really, really fast transactions in that region. But if I wanna survive again, right, I want one piece of the, the, the replica, one replica in each range. Okay, transactions are gonna to have to go across the speed of light. And at some point, you know, uh, that's the ultimate battle. And so how do I survive and, and do these things? And so that's where configuration of, of, of what you wanna do actually is, is, is really, really important. So, I, all right, long story short. So how do transactions work in, um, in, in Cockroach database? This is a really uh, quick version of this. Um, again, in our docs, there is a page that's called the life of a transaction. Um, fantastic material. Um, it's almost prose. I, these guys are poets. So it's it, these guys and girls, the team are poets. So I, I would check that out. Some really interesting things. So I want to insert two records into the dogs table. I want to insert Ozzy and Sunny. Well, they're in two different ranges, right? So how's that going to work, right, Jim? Because it's not, it's, remember, it's not all stored in the same place, right? So what happens is, well, that, that's one query. That query is going to be broken down into um, uh, execution steps, right? And so what does that query execution look like? We have a query planner that allows you to investigate that. We actually do cost-based optimization as well in the database. Talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But first thing is, okay, begin transaction. Great. Okay. Now I want to write Sunny. What it does is, and this gateway, I, I actually am purposely uh, depicting it in green. Now it is any of those nodes, any one of these four nodes could have accepted this query. All it has to do is find the raft leader for where I need to insert Sunny. And it found it and it's on node one. Great. And it says, hey, raft leader, I have this transaction I need to start create a pending record. It's actually in the table itself. And so it's actually stored with it. And so I have a pending record. Now this transaction is pending. What it's going to do, it's going to communicate with its two um, replicas. One of the replicas is going to come back and say, great, I'm good. It has a temporary record. It's going to say, great. Okay, good. I've started that. Great. Now I'm ready to accept the next bit. Great. I'm going to go find now the other uh, raft leader. I'm going to write that record. I'm going to get back an acknowledgement from at least one of them because I need two or three to commit. Now I haven't actually committed the transaction yet, right? I can't actually send back to the 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 the, the query through that endpoint, which is this gateway, that this thing is actually done. So once that comes back, and now I have basically a commit from all the ranges, everything within this whole thing, I can now send a commit back to the application and commit that data. So what I've done is I've done quorum writes across multiple different ranges. Now, this is in the good case. Now, I, I can't even start to tell you all the ways in which this can go wrong um, and all the ways this can go wrong when there's multiple different uh, applications accidents in this. I, I wanted to actually just portray some core concepts. And A, it's how we use Raft to gain quorum writes, right? The Raft leader is actually understanding that. And now we have this kind of arbitrary, temporary transactional record that actually is controlling when the commit happens. Now, this execution and everything else is, is much more complex than that uh, and, a, and a deeper conversation. In fact, we had Andrew Werner from our engineering team on talking about distributed transactions. Um, we did cockroach hours, uh, it was a couple weeks ago. Uh, but that uh, Andrew had talked in, in, in great length about some really interesting things um, and it's on, a, it's on our YouTube channel. And again, I gotta say that the docs does a pretty good job of, of describing all these things, so. Okay, so this is where it gets interesting. Actually, the next part is where it gets really, really some deep, deep software engineering. But I, I think about, you know, a distributed database. If I, if I talk to you about the distributed storage layer and how we actually, it isn't distributed storage, actually, it's distributed, like how the KV layer, how we're actually interacting with, with, the, with, the, with the, you know, the physical disk. If I talked about that alone, I would not be doing justice. Um, 
a true distributed database is distributed at the execution layer. And, and you do this because basically you can't have a single write node, right? Because every node within Cockroach can accept a query and understand where data lives throughout it, that's truly distributed. This isn't like Postgres on top of distributed storage where I have a single write node and I don't have multi-master, right? Like everything, like it, this is full master and everything's active, active, right? And so we had to actually um, recreate the entire execution engine. Now, what we've done is at the storage layer is different, at the execution layer is different, but at the top layer, what we expose to the developer is still familiar SQL, okay? I like to think about, I'm an old Hadoop guy, so I like, the way th I like to think about the way that we do execution of SQL queries to be a little bit like MapReduce, so it's the easiest way for me to actually understand this. But what we're doing is we're basically decomposing a query into parts um, and then executing that where the data lives. We're just pushing it down, map, and then reduce, right? I mean, this is kind of a, one of those core concepts, right? Um, I like to think about it like that. It's not exactly that, but um, that's pretty much how it works. So let's just say I have a query. I want to select a count from country, um, um, from customers. And I want to group them by country, right? It's, there's a couple things going on here. So the first thing we do, we send that. Um, it's going to go to one of the nodes. We're going to find the RAF leader. Um, we're going to go out and we're going to do scans across each one of the replica sets in each of the regions, right? Um, and we're going to look for um, across all of the country table, we're going to look across the entire thing and we're just going to run scans, right? Remember I was talking about earlier, we can do really, really efficient scans when that data is all local and close together, right? So I'm actually, um, because we are KV and everything is logically ordered, I can do, I can efficiently say like, I don't have to go back and forth between each of the replicas to do the scan. I'm just doing a scan in region, scan scan and I can actually take all that data because this is KV and it's all logically sorted, right? And alphabetical, if you will. Um, I can now just do the scan in each region. I can do the group by there because I'm, 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 a, I'm good because basically I know basically by key that they're all in order, right? And now I could send this back to the originator and it can actually pull all this together and send it back to the originating uh, query, whoever actually asked for that, right? So we can do some really cool things there, right? And that's like this distributed execution. Now, there are some really complicated uh, queries that can go on. Uh, you know, we actually have built a cost-based optimizer as well um, that uses the distributed nature of the database in this. So Rebecca Taft on our team, uh, and actually the whole team published a uh, paper um, to Sigmod, uh, our Sig uh, the last Sigmod, there was a paper that goes into depth about this as well. Again, we're all about sharing. So in our docs, uh, in our blog, uh, the, the Sigmod pa paper is another great place to go um, to check this thing out as well, um, which I think is, is very valuable. But again, uh, you know, this is kind of one of those things you just expect to have in a database. And so a mature database will have this kind of cost-based optimization. So um, we do uh, provide a query planner. Um, you can look into queries. You can actually start to see uh, and, and, and it have some sort of observability in two transactions and what's happening. Um, and so lots coming there. And, you know, I was joking with a friend the other day, uh, CBO is never done. That, that work will go on forever and ever and ever and ever because things can always be optimized. But, uh, you know, we've done some, some really great work there. And, and again, there's some, some great material out there to, to, to look through that stuff. So, all right. So now uh, let's talk about latency. Um, latency is kind of one of these things that uh, I guess you don't think about until you're actually distributed. Um, and it is kind of one of these, these topics that, you know, I think, you know, in the beginning, in the old world, um, um, actually the, the Sigmod paper, somebody was just asking, I, 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 I know it's online somewhere. I'll, I'll rely on the team to actually get that out there. Thank you all for basically dumping these, these, these things in there, Tim and Chris, you guys rock. Um, in the old world, you know, we had an application server and we had a database. The latency was as far away as that machine was from that database, right? It was pretty quick. Well, what happened is, you know, as we become distributed and as people are accessing data from all over the planet, well, I mean, a, 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 a hop from, you know, San Francisco to, to Richmond is, you know, it's going to take some time. It's about 70, 70 milliseconds round trip. You know, from New York, maybe that's 12 milliseconds. Well, if you're executing a query and it takes multiple different transactions and multiple hops, uh, depending on how your code is written or uh, how that actually the, the query is being executed, this could take a long time. Um, there was a, there's a, there's something called the hundred millisecond rule. There was a guy named Paul, oh man, I'm, I, you guys, I'm so sorry. 
Paul Bechtel or Paul Bechtel. Uh, there's a, if you look up 100 millisecond rule in Google, you'll find it. Um, and there's been a lot of research in terms of what is real time for the end user. And they say that the, the limit is really 100 milliseconds. And after 100 milliseconds, um, it'll appear to the end user who's on their phone or on their, 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 phone, their laptop or whatever, that that's not in real time. And so, you know, as we kind of transition to, you know, faster internet speeds, more traffic, uh, global audiences, you know, this is 70 milliseconds across the country. Well, what happens when, you know, add the 200 milliseconds it's going to take from, you know, Singapore or Sydney to get to the West Coast and then that hop over, you know, you, you, you get into these, these latency issues. And it, it creates the kind of SLA issues for customers, right? And by the way, you know, having a single database can become a right bottleneck too. Uh, you don't just need to scale reads um, or, or volume of data. You need to scale volume of transactions too. So how do we actually deal with this, right? And having, you know, multiple rewrite nodes in the right places to both deal with uh, a, a transactional volume, but latency is really kind of one of those things where, where cockroach really, really shines. So what, well, if you think about this, you know, one of the things that actually people are doing about it as well, and, and this is actually an issue, is, you know, when we did, um, you know, when we wanted a, a backup, you know, like one of the failure modes of having this as, as, your, as your initial system is what happens when that thing fails down in North Carolina? I, I, I said Virginia, but what happens if maybe it is still Richmond kind of, um, you know, what happens when that, that region fails? Well, I'm gone, I'm out. Like, and so what people do is they typically will set up you know, some another kind of active passive system. So you take the entire database, you're using asynchronous replication, you have that entire system up and running in some backup zone. And in case of failure, you're just redirecting traffic to, uh, in this case, Arkansas. Um, so what's happened in that time? It takes time. Um, you may be losing transactions. Um, that database is gonna be online. It's gonna be online for a while uh, until you get the original active system up online. Um, they are now out of sync. Uh, bringing those two things back together and remediating the differences between, you know, the active and the passive as the passive came in and became primary, difficult. Um, you know, I think we saw issues like this. I know GitHub had some serious out outages with their, with their database side. Think about the amount of commits and the amount of code that was happening and resolving that across all the customers. It, it's, it's, it's a problem, right? And so having this kind of active passive was the way that we actually have dealt with things in the past. Now, you know, Cockroach is a little bit different, right? Not only are we dealing with this kind of active passive setup, right? Because, well, we're writing data in triplicate. We can have data spread across, say, the entire country. We can have clusters running in U.S. West 1, U.S. West 2, you know, U.S. Central. We can have two on the East Coast, right? And so what we've done is we, we, we shrink the, the latency hops, right, number one. But we now have these backup systems, right? So this whole resilience thing I was talking about, when you lose a node, you're still good, right? You're still going to have that thing. So Ultimately, every node in Cockroach is active. So this is active active. I don't need this, this, this active passive system. Now, we understand that you still need point in time recovery. We understand that you need backup and restore. Now, backup and restore in a distributed system, it's a different equation, right? Because remember I was talking about being able to tie data to a location? Well, when you back up database, it better be distributed as well and be able to tie that data to that. That backup needs to live in that location. How do you actually organize all that? So, one of these challenges that I think, you know, uh, our team has done a great job dealing with. Um, but now, you know, if I have users on the East and West Coast, I have shrank now the, the, the latency times for them to access that data. Um, and they're still accessing that data based across this entire cluster uh, of information that's running across the entire country, right? So it's a little bit about latency and kind of this equality that we can get um, no matter where people are at. And remember, um, I can ask a query uh, across any one of these nodes. I simply, typically what people do is simply set up a load balancer in front of, you know, each one of these, each one of these regions, um, and it's just dispersing it to each one of the nodes, and the node knows where to find the data across the entire cluster. The data doesn't need to live out in LA or in Iowa, uh, but the cluster just knows where all this stuff is. I could spin up a node right here on this laptop, point it at the cluster, and it can accept queries and find the entire data, right? It physically it's separated, logically appears to be one single database. These could be on different uh, cloud providers if you want it as well, so truly multi-cloud. Um, each one of these could be its own Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we see that as well, so you know, multi-region uh, Kubernetes clusters, right? So there's lots of things that you can do here. So uh, Nicholas, thank you for finding the, uh, the, the 100 millisecond rules. Paul, I, I don't wanna mess up his last name. Bucket, 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 Bucket. I, I gotta meet the guy, so. 
All right, so let's see, I have seven minutes. Um, remember earlier I was talking about segmenting data? Um, I, I told you I wasn't gonna be CLI today, but there's a little bit here. Um, basically what you're looking at is a creation of a table, the customer table. Now I can partition values um, with particular uh, keys um, that are gonna be tied to locations. And so what I'm doing here, basically I'm gonna partition by list and I'm gonna use locality, right? Because the primary key is locality and ID, right? And I'm gonna partition this list by locality so that all the keys that are US West, um, all, all those that are West, this locality, are gonna live in these nodes, US West and US West 2. All those that are central, locality is central, right? And locality is part of this key, right? The primary key, uh, they're gonna be in central. And then East is East and East 4. Right, so now I've actually distributed the data to where it needs to be. And that was simple at the creation of the table time. Now the database, when I insert new records and it's, it's a central record, it's gonna be written into the central, right? And so we can do that. We can do that um, within each table will be different, but it's at the row level. Some data you wanna live everywhere, right? And so maybe you, you don't want this to be segmented to particular places. We can also alter partitions. Um, you know, in this case, this is in production. We're just going to alter partition of a table, right? So we can, um, the zone configurations of what we call that, right? And so we can add new regions. Uh, we can subtract regions. Uh, we can we can change where leaseholders are as well. Remember the leaseholder is like the, the ultimate for where a transaction actually happens. So, you know, say I think, you know, this, 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 the, the leaseholder is, is important for the customer table and all the German records here. I want all the German record leaseholders to live in Germany yet I'm still gonna have copies in other places because I know that most of the records are gonna be accessed there. That's how I get this very fast access for transactions and these sort of things, right? And so um, really critical, there is so much power here. Um, again, in our docs, there's this uh, section called database topologies. Uh, we had a cockroach hour on that where uh, our friend Jesse joined us. Um, really, really useful stuff there, so. Um, so I want to actually get to the end here. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through um, some transaction performance. Now, there's a lot of stuff that we're doing in the background of CockroachDB that basically is, is, is optimizing the way that we run transactions. You, you can't just have this serial execution of a transaction, right? Here's, a, here's writing of data to a table. You know, typically, you're just going back and forth. Oh, this is going to take forever. We're actually doing some... Um, some pipelining here. So we're actually committing Carl and Nate, Carl and Nigel, and then we're saying, okay, can this transaction commit with these keys? Great, it's committed, and we come back. So the difference here is, you know, about a third of that transaction, right? And so that that was the first step. Now we've done something else uh, recently, and again, a parallel commits, I believe, is in the Sigmod paper as well. Um, but we're doing something that's really cool. We're actually kind of pre-committing, um, you know, the, the rights and that, that transaction commit as well, all at once. We're doing that, say, on one node, sending it back to another node, and as long as everything looks okay, we can actually commit all of those, right? And so um, we can actually shrink now the time it takes for a transaction to be committed um, significantly. Um, you know, I know Kyle, uh, you know, who runs all the Jepson said Kyle Kingsbury runs all the Jepson tests. I think when he first saw this, he was like, I don't know, some magic happens here. Um, it's some software engineering magic. And so we're doing some really cool things. It has been proven with TLA plus. So before we get that question, um, but there's this is another area where we're doing some really, really advanced data science or advanced software engineering um, to, to improve really transactional performance. And again, it's unique to a distributed database, right? So, oh my God, I covered everything in about 57 minutes and there was a whole mess of questions. So First of all, thank you, Tim and Chris, for jumping in and doing all that, you guys, because I don't think I've, I, I, I just said a lot. I hope this was valuable to everybody. I hope, um, you know, we, we at least opened up your eyes to some of the core concepts um, that I presented here on the screen right now. Um, if you have any questions, again, our docs are phenomenal. Our team is phenomenal. I, I'm just, I'm proud and just honored to be a part of it because uh, some of the stuff we're doing here is pretty advanced and, and pretty awesome. Check out the Sigma paper. It, it's, it, you know, it's pretty, pretty amazing stuff. So um, again, um, if you want to learn more, I think you, somebody actually talked about Cockroach University. If you want to learn about Raft, you want to learn about the basics of Cockroach. Um, Will, Lauren, uh, Crossman, you guys do a great job. Um, you know, we're building, we're always building out new coursework. Go out and check that out, you know, get certified. Um, that's all for free. Uh, you go out and roll today off our website. If you want to try Cockroach, uh, you can download Cockroach Core and use it. Um, you can use Helm, you can Docker Propose. 
Um, you know, we have enterprise version, but you can go out and try Cockroach Cloud today. Um, and we'll give you a free 30 day cluster. So you can actually try and play with these things today. Um, it is the easiest way to adopt Cockroach database uh, today. Um, and that's just available off of the Get Cockroach to be off our website. So with that, uh, I think there were a lot of questions and I'm at two minutes and I've talked a lot and I'm now done talking for the day, I think. So um, again, uh, thank you all so much for taking time out of your day. Um, I know time is extremely valuable uh, and, and I hope this was A, uh, insightful and, and helpful for you, but B, also maybe slightly entertaining. I do believe there's a survey after this. Uh, we do welcome all feedback. It's, it's very important to us. I'd love to know um, how all this came across, if this was useful and whatnot. Um, so any and all feedback, there is a survey that's gonna come up. Please, please do um, participate that. And then finally, Tim and Chris, uh, guys, thank you so much for helping out here. I hope, I, I would love to look through this chat because I think there was some really great stuff. So um, thank you everybody and have a great rest of your Wednesday.